good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, talk. Uh, we're lucky tonight we've got Barry Henwood, the county recorder here, uh, who's going to tell us a bit about the secret lives of Dartmoor's butterflies. Uh, so I hope you're looking forward to that. Uh, and I hope we're going to find out a lot more secrets and uh, interesting facts about Dartmoor's butterflies. Uh, today is a fantastic day, isn't it? The uh, weather's really picked up today. Uh, we're full of the joys of spring here. We've been out with uh, a, a school today, back out on the moor, so it feels like life is slowly creeping back to normality. Uh, so uh, those of you who are just arriving, I can see there's uh, quite a few of you just uh, arriving now. If you're not familiar with uh, this platform, it's really simple. Uh, just sit back and grab yourself a cuppa and enjoy tonight's talk. Uh, if you want to join in and ask questions, then we've got a live chat function in the uh, in the YouTube, so you can have a go with that. If you don't want to sign into YouTube, you can always email us at education at dartmoor.gov and you can see that email address on our screen now. So we're really lucky, as I say, to have Barry with us today. He's going to talk to us about the secret lives of some of the, uh, the butterflies on Dartmoor. Uh, it's a great place here on Dartmoor for butterflies. Uh, and you'll see that it's home to nationally important butterflies that thrive in its special habitats, from the woodland glades to wet meadows and areas of bracken on the open moorland. Uh, this is the perfect time to get to grip with, grips with butterflies as a beautifully camouflaged pearl board of cotillaries will soon be on the wing. Well, they actually are on the wing, aren't they now? Heralding a summer filled with glimpses of marsh cotillaries and other rarities. Uh, Barry has a long interest in wildlife, especially butterflies and moths. And with Phil Sterling, he wrote the field guide of the caterpillars of Great Britain and Ireland, illustrated by Richard Lewington and published in 2020. As I said, he's also the county uh, moth recorder and he manages a database of nearly 1.25 million records. So if you've ever sent a record in of a butterfly, it's probably passed through Barry's hands at some point there. Uh, so he must have a very big filing cabinet or else he must have master the databases uh, of the computers. Uh, so I think that's probably enough rambling from me just to sort of set the scene. Uh, so I'll bring Barry on uh, by my side here. So uh, uh, good evening, Barry. Good to see you. Hi. Yep, I'm ready to go. Excellent. OK, right. Well, um, I've just given you a bit of introduction. I uh, hope that was fair. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Excellent. Um... And I'm looking forward, as I'm sure all the other people here tonight are looking forward to finding out a bit more about Dartmoor's butterflies. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll disappear from the screen. I'll be monitoring the emails and the live chat uh, in the background. Uh, so I'll hand over to Barry and then I'll join you at the end on screen and we can discuss some of the questions that have come in. Uh, but I'm looking forward to tonight's talk, as I say. So I will uh, make you go uh, full screen and then uh, you can take it away. So uh, over to you, Barry. Barry, thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, you know, if you just bear with me one second, I had a the stopwatch app on my phone all set up and then an advert pinged up. So there we are. So I can see how I'm getting on. Right, thank you very much. So I'm going to share the, um, we'll start the, uh, the slideshow now. Right, the lives of Dartmoor's butterflies. Well, yes, thank you, Andy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am the county recorder for moths, not butterflies, really. And if you added the butterflies into the data, the butterflies and moths together would be over one and a half million records. And as Andy said, I've always had a, a lifelong interest in butterflies and moths, but not only the beautiful adult insects you see flying around, but uh, but also their, their entire lives. And for, for most of them, the adult is only part of the part of a, sh a short part of their lives compared with most of them spend the winter as caterpillars so you know they're spending a huge amount of time in that stage so we'll go straight in um just a quick uh, plug for the book um and it's because of my interest in the, in the whole of the life histories that i was invited to uh to write this book and it deals with about 800 and uh 
32 species, I think we did in it, including the larger, all the larger moths you're likely to find the caterpillars of and the butterflies. So into the butterflies. And so what we're going to do, we're going to deal with Dartmoor special butterflies to start with, really, and then a quick whiz through at the end of some butterflies of the wider countryside. So this is a male marsh fritillary. The marsh fritillary in Devon occurs on these sort of wet grass pasture type areas, mainly on the moors. And uh, in, in Dorset and other places, it can also occur on chalk downland. But um, it's undergone a huge decline. When I was researching for the Caterpillar book, I was trawling through the Entomologist's Gazette and came across a note from 1957 where it was described as one of the commonest butterflies in northwest Devon. And there are stories from Ireland of people having to barricade their doors to stop their hordes of caterpillars entering the house and of how they used to brush them up into piles and burn them because they were just so abundant. But now it's so rare, it's got full legal protection. And I've just heard this week that it has now just been declared extinct in the Netherlands. So it's a, a butterfly in real trouble, really. But um, fortunately, there are some decent sites for it on Dartmoor where they're looked after. So this is the female now with a sort of bigger checkered pattern. And she lays her eggs in a big batch on the food plant Devil's Bit Scabious. Oh, sorry, and there's the underside, underside of the male, I think. Quite attractive, too. And the mating pair. So she lays her eggs on, on Devil's Bit Scabious and they hatch out. And the caterpillars live communally. And you can see here they've spun a web and been eating from the upper surface of the leaf. And they continue into late summer and they become a bit blackish now and they still live communally in a web. And then for the winter, they just settle down in a web, which is raised a bit off the ground. And they enter what's known as diapause, diapause being the cold blooded animals equivalent of hibernation, really, that uh, that some mammals do. And then in the spring, they wake up and they feed communally still for a while. And then when they're reaching full growth, they wander off and live a more solitary existence. And you can sometimes see them wandering around like this. So that's the uh, final in the star marsh fritillary caterpillar. And there's another one there. And it's got an absolutely beautiful pupa, which be jolly lucky to see this. I was helping run a marsh fritillary survey training workshop one day and somebody on the workshop managed to find this. So I was very lucky to get a photo of it there in the wild. Now, the other fritillaries of, of Dartmoor, most of them like this sort of habitat. So it's a uh, a, a bracken covered slope on which their food plant, common dog violet mainly, Viola riviniana, grows. And we often think of bracken as a bit of a boring, nasty plant on the moor, really. But as we'll come to see in a moment, it's really important for the horticology of some of these fritillaries. So this is some um, Blackett and Down Devon Wildlife Trusts nature reserve, which is home to many of these fritillaries that I'm going to talk about now, not the marsh fritillary, I hasten to add. And so um, you know, Blackett and Down and the Dart Valley nature reserves are very good places to see them. Is everything OK now? Yeah, OK. Um, so pearl bordered fritillary, as Andy said, is flying now. And uh, it's, um, yeah, it's probably been out since about the middle of April. And so you can go to these places I've described and see them flying. The only snag is that there's a very similar species, the small pearl border fritillary, which looks very similar. But we'll come along to the differences uh, later on. So beautiful butterfly. And uh, if you look at the underside, the underside is the crucial bit to tell them apart. You will see differences described on the top side, maybe in the textbooks, but the trouble is the pattern varies a bit and it's fairly subtle and I really wouldn't advise, I, well, I really don't think you should 
identify one of the one of these species on the basis of the upper side. You've really got to see the underside. As a bit of a clue, the pearl board of fritillary is a sort of brighter orange than the than the small pearl board, but it'll it'll give you a clue rather than being definitive. So what I want you to notice here, the, the silvery spots are why it's called the pearl board of fritillary. And it's got this black spot here, which in this particular individual is reasonably big, but it's often smaller than that. And here, it's this bit of the wing you need to look at. There are no silvery spots here, okay? And uh, there's a mating pair of pearl border fritillary, and you'll see here the black spot down here is really quite small, and there's no, no pearls here. And it lays its eggs on Viola riviniana, and uh, the caterpillars start to feed immediately, and they feed for a while, but later on in the summer, they stop feeding and go into their diapause. And they stay in this diapause until the following spring when they wake up and start feeding again. And in, in the late summer, of course, it's, you know, it's reasonably warm still on the, in the air. But, you know, where they are, it's going to be fairly shaded by bracken. And yet in the spring, they, they wake up really early in the spring. And this bracken is really important because it's dark coloured. It absorbs the radiant heat from the sun and it heats up a sort of area of, uh, a layer of air close to the ground so you end up with this really warm microclimate which helps the caterpillars to feed and digest their food and grow and uh, now we're on to the small pearl border fritillary now that i haven't seen any yet but they if they're not out yet they will be out very soon and so there's this overlap period now when you've got the two species around. And as you can see from the top side, they're jolly similar. And one difference is that although occasionally a, a pearl border fritillary has been reported as producing a second generation, just the odd one may have been reported. I've never, I've never ever seen them. The small pearl border fritillary often does produce a second generation but it's a partial second generation. So in other words, some of the caterpillars from arising from eggs laid in May or June go on to produce a second generation in August, but some of them go into diapause and produce the adults the following spring. So this is clearly a second generation individual because it's feeding on ragwort flowers. And this is on the south coast, this one. The pearl border fritillary you won't find on the south coast of Devon. It's pretty much, you know, confined to suitable habitats on Dartmoor and around, whereas the small pearl border fritillary will go on the coast as well as these bracken covered slopes and actually also goes on the bogs on Dartmoor where the larvae will feed on marsh violet as well as the common dog violet on the bracken covered slopes. OK, so if we look on the underside, you've got a bigger black spot here. And in particular, it's this area. You see, you've got these these silvery, pearly spots here, which you didn't have on the pearl border fritillary. So you've pretty much got to see the underside. And there's another one, again, feeding in late summer. Uh, this one on Bell Heather on the coast of Cornwall. And here we are side by side. So comparison, relatively small black spot, bigger black spot here. No um, silvery spots here and silvery spots here. So that's how to tell them apart. And the small pearl border fritillary caterpillar, as we said, feet on um, common dog violet mainly, and that's its caterpillar there. Now the silver washed fritillary is is a big fritillary now. So we're going to talk about three big fritillaries now. This is the first of them. And it's a woodland insect, really. Um, this is the female. So it's got a distinctive pattern. You can't muddle it with the others, really. And that's the male, which again, has got a distinctive pattern, which you can't really muddle. And uh, they lay their eggs, although the food plant is, again, common dog violet, they lay their eggs not on the violet, but on the trunks of trees, maybe in the cracks in the barks of oak trees or on moss on the tree trunks. And the eggs hatch into the tiny caterpillars in a week or two. And the caterpillars 
go immediately into diapause. They don't feed at all until the spring when they drop to the ground and they've got to wander off and try and bump into a, a violet leaf somewhere. And uh, there's a mating pair up on an oak tree. And you can see on the underside there why it's called a silver washed fritillary. Right, and there's the spectacular spiky caterpillar of the silver washed fritillary. Right, now we're going to go on to the dark green and high brown fritillaries. Um, the dark green, this is the dark green fritillary which occurs on those sites on Dartmoor I've mentioned, but also it occurs elsewhere in Devon, particularly on the south coast. And uh, this is a female with the sort of paler spots along the edge of the wing here, these pale orangey yellow spots. But what I want you to particularly notice about this dark green fritillary is this line of black spots here apart from the one on the end here, these are all pretty much in a straight line, okay? And this is the underside of the dark green fritillary. We've got a row of silvery spots here and a row of silvery spots here, and there's no spots in between. And uh, here we have a dark green fritillary caterpillar. And uh, these things move around at enormous speed from time to time. And, you know, I just occasionally come across them crossing a path, but they really do move very fast when they want to. And here is a high brown fritillary now. So if you notice this, um, these black spots here, so you've got, um, they're in a sort of curve. They're not in a straight line like they were with the dark green fritillary. And this one's smaller and certainly set further back towards the middle of the wing. And then if we look at the underside, you've got a row of silvery spots here, a row of silvery spots here as you had with the dark green, but you've got this extra row of brown spots with a silvery centre here. So that's the crucial difference between the dark green and high brown fritillaries. To be honest, with experience, you can confidently identify them from the top side, but you shouldn't do that unless you really have got your eye in and you really, really know what you're doing. And there's a mating pair of high brown fritillaries taken in the Dart Valley Reserve. And uh, here we are side by side. So a dark green fritillary with its black spots in a straight line. And here, they're not in such a straight line and this one's set back. And uh, another individual of a dark green fritillary here, again with a straight line of spots here. And that's the original slide. Now, last year I was uh, lucky enough to just happen to notice a caterpillar of the high brown fritillary as I was out for a walk, which was lucky really, because they're quite hard to see. And we'll now come on to why other reasons why the bracken is important. So we talked about how it warms up a microclimate close to the ground in the spring. But uh, the high brown fritillary actually pretty much lays its eggs on bracken and the eggs don't actually hatch until the spring. The, the caterpillar is fully formed inside the egg, but they don't hatch until the spring. Conversely, the dark green fritillary, the eggs hatch straight away, but like the silver wash, the caterpillars go into immediate diapause and don't feed until the spring. So the bracken is important for the high brown fritillary as somewhere to lay the eggs, and also, it's really quite cryptic along the dead fronds of the bracken. And this one was very active. It was wandering around and feeding. But I'd love to have been able to get a photo of it with this dorsal stripe of the caterpillar lined up along the uh, midrib of the dead bracken frond. And then it would have looked much more cryptic than it, cryptic than it is now. And then if we have a close up, I mean, it's a s stunning caterpillar, really. I was, so pleased to have stumbled across it. So 
what do we do to help these uh, fritillaries on the bracken covered slopes? Well, we have a group of volunteers that meet every Wednesday, the Devon Wildlife Trust volunteer group that doesn't work on these bracken covered slopes every week, but we certainly do uh, a decent amount of the time. And we're asked to sort of mimic large grazing animals really and sort of cut tracks through the bracken just to open it up really and, and allow a bit of light in for the violets in it and it seems to help and of course you know in this last winter we haven't been able to operate like that because of the public health situation but our place has been taken by a robo flail a robotic device which goes round and uh, flails the bracken it doesn't do the whole thing obviously we, we just do it in tracks tracts and um, leave some untouched and some tracts. It, it just seems to work as the, as the management for these fritillaries. Right, so side by side, we've got the dark green fritillary with no spots here and the high brown fritillary with the spots here. OK. Right, I just will mention one more fritillary. This is the Heath fritillary. Again, it's got full legal protection, a rare butterfly which occurs at Lidford, but only on a butterfly conservation reserve. And uh, I'm afraid you have to be a member of butterfly conservation to be able to go and see it. But the site is managed specifically for it and, um, and they're doing OK there. Otherwise, they occur on Exmoor and in the south east of England at Kent and Essex. So the Heath fritillary, that's the upper side. So we go on to the underside of the mating pair there. Now on Exmoor, the main food plant is common cow wheat, but on the Lidford site, the main food plant is ribwort plantain. There's the caterpillar and there's a ribwort plantain leaf. Interestingly, the high brown fritillary caterpillar looks very like that until its final instar. So don't quite know why it's, these patterns have evolved, but it's interesting that the two are, are quite similar at, at a certain stage. And at times in places, it can become very abundant. And when that happens, the caterpillars will use all sorts of other different plants as well, even foxgloves to, um, to eat. Right now, um, we're leaving the fritillaries. And the fritillaries, the, particularly the pearl bordered, small pearl bordered fritillary and um, the heath fritillary used to love coppiced woodland. You know, the, the coppice would be done, so light would get into the woodland, the violets would grow and they'd thrive. And then the, the coppiced stools would begin to grow up and another area in the wood would get coppiced. And so the colony would move. But when coppicing ceased, the fritillaries struggled, really, and they really disappeared over much of southern England, particularly the southeast. But as the woodland grew up and became more shady, the White Admiral thrived, it, it, it spread its distribution because it needs shady woodland. So this was taken on Devon Wildlife Trust, Buffy Heath actually, but if you want to see it on Dartmoor, it's the East Dartmoor National Nature Reserve in the Buffy Valley woodlands. There's um, decent numbers of them along there. But I'm going to indulge myself now and go into great detail on the life history of the White Admiral because it's so interesting. So the White Admiral, as I say, needs deep shady woodland. And this is an example of where, it, where the caterpillars live in the shady woodland. And in particular, this leaf here is where there is or has been a caterpillar. So if I crop the image, it's a bit blurry, but you've got what appears to be the wood, the um, midrib of the honeysuckle leaf, the honeysuckle being the food plant, and you've got this curious structure hanging down here. And this is a very small caterpillar that's done this, and it looks as if it's eaten a huge amount of leaf. But as we'll see in a minute, it hasn't really eaten as much as it looks as if it has there. So and to give you some idea how shady the woodland is, this is about six o'clock in the evening in the middle of August, and we're using a torch here to get a good view of the caterpillar. And you can see this is really scrappy honeysuckle. You know, this here is the sort of stuff it's eating. It cannot cope with the lush honeysuckle in the woodland ride. So it lays its eggs on the, lays its eggs singly on the margin of the leaf of honeysuckle. 
And if we crop that image, you'll get a better view of the wonderful sculpturing on the egg. And then it hatches and the caterpillar has to overcome the first line of the honeysuckle's defence, which is to negotiate these hairs. And in many ways, this is a story of overcoming the plant's defence against attack from the caterpillars. So the egg hatches out into the caterpillar. The caterpillar gets to the, makes its way to the tip of the honeysuckle leaf and it starts eating. We've seen it's eaten a bit here, and it's been eaten a bit here. And this is very soon after hatching now and it's passed this food straight through the gut. It hasn't digested it properly. So you can see the frost pellets are sort of yellowy green here. And what it started to do here is to stick the, is to uh, stick the fresh pellets to the tip of the leaf using silk. And it's obviously really important to it that it does this, because as I say, it passes it through the gut without digesting it properly. And later on the same day, this is what's happened. So it's now beginning to pass through darker frass pellets, so more digestion is happening. And it's sown more frass pellets here with silk, creating this pier at the tip of the leaf. And it's eaten in here, and it's eaten in here. And there it is, it's resting on the pier that it's constructed. And a bit later on, you can see it's how it feeds here. So it eats in here like this, it eats a channel in here, and it's gonna cut this flag of leaf off. And you can see the other side, it's cut the flag of leaf off, which has dropped down here, but remains suspended with silk fibers. And there a bit later, so we cut this this flag off now and that's flag suspended and it's eaten in this way and it's going to cut this flag off next and now it's resting on the pier and you can see the exposed midrib here it's it's sheared off the hairs and it's um, covered the midrib with silk which makes it easier for it to move around and here we are still in the first instar now you've got the pier here midrib here Caterpillar covered with some frass pellets. And you can notice a frass pellet here on this leaflet that's been dropped down. And now the same pattern, same things happening, continue to eat in, dropping these flags of leaf down. And you can see lots of flag pellets in it now. And so this structure has been turned an aerial latrine. But to be honest, we don't really know what the function of it is, but it clearly goes to great trouble to construct it. Um, and on we go. So here it is, it's at the end of its first instar now, an instar being the stage between shedding of skin. So in, this is the first instar which lasts from coming out of the egg until the first skin is shed. This is the pier here with all the frass pellets um, sewn together with, with silk and there's the start of the midrib. And it sheds its skin and takes on this more spiny appearance now. And you can see it's moving this aerial latrine proximally on the leaf as it as the feeding tracts back here. And one thing it does, it um, sows the petiole of the honeysuckle leaf to the stem. And I think this is because in the middle of August, it can be really dry. And not only is it using this scrappy honeysuckle, but these leaves are very liable to, to drop off in the dry woodland in the middle of August. And so I think by sowing the petiole to the stem, it prevents its, the leaf that it's feeding on and living on from falling to the ground. And here we are, here we are now, we've got into the third instar now, it's even more spiky, and you can see the same feeding pattern carrying on. And here's a sideways view, and you can see this aerial latrine now is really quite a, an, an interesting structure and I can tell you now how it moves it because it was here when it was first constructing it wasn't it it's moved it all the way back here and what it does it cuts the thread of silk here which is hitching it up here then it grabs the um, latrine here and hitches it up here with another strand of silk and then to move it oh sorry I didn't mean to move on there but never mind we can we can look at it here so it's cut this strand here hitched it up here, and then the next time it wants to move it, it'll cut this strand here. So clever stuff, really. And then later in the third instar, it starts to prepare for the winter. 
So the first thing it does is to sow the petiole to the stem. It may use the leaf it's been feeding on, or it may choose a new leaf. So it sows the petiole to the stem, and then it cuts a notch out of the base of the leaf on both sides. And it spins a silk pad, which it's resting on here, and that's what it's going to really attach itself to for the winter. And it cuts a channel in from the side of the leaf to just beyond the midrib, and folds this bit of the leaf over itself, and that's what it's going to hide in. So it's the, the, this hypernaculum is under construction here, and there it is, it's been constructed. And uh, there's, you can see there, clearly the notch, it's cut out of the base of the leaf. And you can imagine if it didn't do that, it would be much more difficult to fold that bit of leaf over. And here's another one, you can see the caterpillar inside. I mean, it's not a very substantial structure, but it will not blow off. It's well and truly sewn to the stem. There's another one, you can see how it's cut into beyond the midrib. And again, the notch, it's cut out of the base of the leaf to aid folding. There are, there are four different types of this hibernaculum, really, but this is the commonest way in which it does it. And there's another one. And this is one where a different type, where it's actually cut right through the leaf and we're left with with the structure looking like this. So this is in the middle of winter now. You can just see the end of the caterpillar poking out here and all these strands of silk you can see, a spider silk. And uh, so that's in the middle of winter. And of course, although it's well sewn to the stem, the sides of the hibernaculum are just dead honeysuckle leaf and they are liable to disintegrate. And on this particular one, it has completely disintegrated. But of course, the silk pad on the midrib here is still there, and the caterpillars well and truly adhere to that. So this is again in the middle of winter. And this one, the hibernaculum must have got wet, I think, and, and, uh, and adhered to the stem of the honeysuckle. And the caterpillar, as you can see, has crawled out. You can see all the silk fibres here sewing it. But um, this one just spent the rest of the winter on the stem of the honeysuckle and it seemed to get through fine. And then in the spring, it emerges and starts to feed. It sheds its skin again and becomes green. And this one's at the end of the fourth in the star now. So it's, this is its old head that's about to drop off, the new head forming below. And then it... Uh, it is the last instar, the fifth instar, and takes on this spectacular appearance. Very difficult to find at this stage, very easy to find in the first and second instars, um, when of course they're much more numerous. You can mark where they are and hope you can find them again in the spring. And then it hangs itself up and creates this amazingly sort of shaped pupa, quite extraordinary really. Now I did say in many ways it was a uh, a story of overcoming the plant's defence. And somebody did take newly hatched white admiral caterpillars and put them on the lush honeysuckle in the woodland ride. And what happened was that the honeysuckle, when the caterpillar started to eat, exuded a sticky substance and uh, it gummed up the caterpillars and they really couldn't survive. And so that was the end of that. So that's why the white admirals have to lay on this scruffy, stressed honeysuckle in the shady woodland that's incapable of mounting that defence against attack. But I'm just going to show you now another different species, which we don't see on Dartmoor or indeed Devon, which overcomes the problem in a different way. This is the broad-bordered bee hawk moth. So it lays its eggs on the underside of honeysuckle, but lush honeysuckle in the woodland ride. And the caterpillar starts to eat a hole from the underside here. But when it's the leaf starts exuding the sticky stuff, it moves over to the other side and makes a hole there. And when that part of the leaf exudes the sticky stuff, it comes over this, the other side again and makes another hole. And so you get these parallel sets of holes and eventually the caterpillar becomes so big that it can cope with the sticky stuff and, uh, and can eat the whole leaf. And that's the fully grown larva of the broad bordered bee hawk moth and the moth itself, which is a wonderful bumblebee mimic. It um, does quite well in Dorset. I'm not really sure why we don't get it in Devon, but we don't. 
Now, another butterfly that um, uh, does quite well in parts of Dartmoor, and in particular the, the Devon Wildlife Trust's Dart Valley Nature Reserve, is the brimstone. And, you know, I see brimstone butterflies in the wider countryside, really. I see them passing through my garden, but there's no larval food plant here. So the larval food plant is either buckthorn, which doesn't really occur in Devon, or alder buckthorn, which does. But it's a bit of a heathland plant, really. So on top here, we've got the male brimstone, which is yellow, and the female below, which is this sort of greeny whitish colour. And to be honest, when it's seen flying at a distance, it rather looks like a large white butterfly. And there's a close up of the of the uh, female brimstone with this sort of greenish white colour. And uh, there's the egg. I mean, the eggs will be being laid soon now and through June. And, you know, they're easy to find on old buckthorn, particularly the small plants. And uh, also you can find the caterpillars which just sit openly on the leaf. And uh, you can see the eaten away leaf. And they're, again, very easy to find. They just sit openly there. And now the purple hair streak. The purple hair streak is quite a widespread butterfly in Devon, but it does particularly well on Dartmoor. And Dartmoor is a really good place to see it because it's a butterfly that hangs around on the canopy of the oak trees, really. It doesn't often come down to feed on flowers. It gets its um, sugars from the honeydew, the aphid secretion on the leaves. So the thing is about the Dartmoor's oaks, they're, they're often quite stunted or may occur on very steep slopes. And if you're at the top, you can look pretty much at the canopy of the, of the tree. So there's, that's how you usually see it, the purple hair streak with its wings closed. And there's a real close up of one. And there's the adult female with these really iridescent purple markings here. The male has a duller purple, but the purple extends over the whole wing. And so that's out in sort of July, August time. And the food plant is oak and they lay their eggs at the base of the terminal bud of oak. So you can go out in the winter months and it's something you can do. You can just look at that, those sites and uh, find the egg of the purple hair streak. So the caterpillar actually overwinters fully fed with fully formed rather within the egg but then hatches in the spring and look at this one see this one's got a hole in it so what's happened here there's a tiny wasp has laid its egg inside the purple hair streak egg <clears throat> and the wasp grub the wasp larva has eaten out the contents of the egg pupated and emerged as a fully formed adult wasp from the purple hair streak egg. So you can imagine how small it is. This tiny wasp completes its life cycle within the egg. And there's the caterpillar, which really looks very cryptic, very hard to see among the opening oak, oak buds. And another one there. Now they're said that to pupate inside ants' nests, but these they're in the family. The hair streaks and the blues are in the family Lysinidae, and many of them have a very close relationship with ants, which is really quite poorly understood. But purple hair streak pupae have been found in the nests of ants. And this is the green hair streak. So this is a common butterfly, which you can see over the moor. Here it's on common bird's foot trefoil, which is one of its food plants. And also it feeds on um, the flowers of, of, of gorse, well, presumably, mm, must, must be Western gorse, I should think, mostly, because uh, the, the other gorse is in flower at the wrong time for the caterpillars. Anyway, um, so that's the green hair streak and another one on bluebell. The top side's just brown, but you never really see that. And that's the caterpillar of the green hair streak on common bird's foot trefoil. And another one here, tucking into a gorse flower. Now, I was going to show you a video here, but we couldn't get it to work earlier, so um, I'm not going to. I'll just skip past this slide. But the point is here that the green hair streak pupa, if you hold it up close to your ear, you can hear it's making quite a noise. And this noise is created by the abdominal segments rubbing against one another. 
And it seems that it's some sort of auditory communication with ants. And the ants seem to take it into their nests. So whether they get any benefit from the pupa itself, I don't know, possibly not. But the pupa gets protection from being surrounded by ants. Um, so if this video would work, you would just see this pupa here being dragged down here. It's just a demonstration of how of how the ants can move a green hair streak pupa. But we'll skip on to the common blue now. So the common blue is quite a ubiquitous butterfly, but it certainly occurs on Dartmoor. And uh, I'm showing it to you really because we can take the story of the ants a bit further. So this is the male, blue all over. And this is the female, which is often brown with a variable amount of blue, but it's always got these orange spots here. But so this, this is an extreme amount of blue for a female and maybe much less, or it may be almost entirely brown, but it's gonna have these orange spots. And there's a mating pair. Notice the pattern of spotting on the underside. And here's an egg, which is laid on its most usual food plant, common bird's foot trefoil, another beautifully sculptured egg. Here's an egg here that's hatched, and this is the typical feeding signs of the first instar of the common blue caterpillar. So it makes a hole in the leaf, sticks its head in, and mines the leaf. So it's eating, eating the parenchyma between the upper and lower epidermis, so you've got a hole here and this sort of um, pale bit where the parenchyma inside the leaf's been uh, eaten away. But there is a micromoth which causes similar feeding damage. So be warned. And again, it's common and you can find that as well. So this is the larval case here of a micromoth called Coleophora discordella. It makes the case out of silk and mine segments of common bird's foot trefoil leaves. And you can see it's feeding damage here. So um, do look out for that, actually. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty common thing on common birds for trefoil, but it's very small. Right, and here's the caterpillar. So you've got uh, the breathing tubes here, the spiracles, OK, these spots here. And here on the seventh abdominal segment, you've got a gland. This is called Newcomer's gland, and it secretes sugars, and you've also got a lot of microscopic glands all over the caterpillar called pore cupola, which secrete sugars and amino acids, which the ants take. So the ants gain benefit from that, and the caterpillar gains protection um, uh, from you know parasites and predators by the by their presence. So it's a real symbiotic relationship. And look at these white spots here. These are actually eversible structures known as tentacle organs. So when the ants are in attendance from time to time, the caterpillar shoots out a structure here that looks about, look a bit like a chimney sweeper's brush. Um, and we don't really know what it's all about. I imagine it's the, the, the um, tentacles at the end are probably either to sense the pheromone perhaps from the ants or else to, to give one off to the ants. It's, um, it's, it's just poorly understood, but it's fascinating to watch. And here again, here's the tentacle organs in the newcomer's gland. And here's an ant actually drinking from the newcomer's gland. And another one here drinking from the newcomer's gland. This one's probably exploring the poor, poor cupola for nutrients. Now, this was the video I was going to show, which would have shown uh, the tentacle organs coming out. But uh, I think we'd better skip, otherwise we're going to get into trouble with it, I'm afraid. And um, <clears throat> this is the holly blue butterfly now. So this is a female with this broad, dark border here. The male is just purely blue, rather like the common blue. And so it's worth um, having a look at the underside to make sure which species you've got. And that's the underside of the holly blue, quite different from the, from the common blue. And this one was in the East Dartmoor National Nature Reserve on that muddy path. And it was flying up and down, but it wasn't 
wanting to land on a flower or just anywhere on the mud. It wanted to land on this bird's dropping and it repeatedly landed on the bird's dropping and was feeding from it. So it, there must be some mineral, something it wanted that it's, that it's getting in this way. And when it came to writing the species accounts for the Caterpillar book, the one I did last of all was the Holly Blue because it's just, I think, so poorly understood. Many a book will tell you that the first instar larvae feed on holly and the second instar on ivy. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that. And um, the fullest account you'll find of the plants it uses in this country is in that in that caterpillar book. Um, but there's still lots we don't know, really. I mean, it, you can find them on on the buds of ivy flowers. And the easiest way to find them is just to find these holes where it's eaten out the content of the bud. So there and there. And here's the caterpillar, which, as you can imagine, would be quite difficult to spot on its own. And here's another one. The colours can vary. This one was given away by the ant that was on it. And here's the newcomer gland here. But um, eggs are seen being laid on all sorts of plants, but whether they complete their life cycle on many of these plants, we don't really know. But uh, there's one, that's an egg. There's the holly blue laid on the, a shoot of, of gorse on the Isles of Scilly. Um, they certainly, they'll certainly They'll certainly eat gorse flowers, and some colonies are thought to exist completely as a result of eating gorse flowers. But uh, this one clearly hasn't been laid anywhere near a flower. It's on the uh, it's on a shoot. And this one again on the Isles of Scilly. There's an empty egg shell there. There's the first instar caterpillar. It's made a hole here. This is the flower bud of bramble. But what I was noticing with these little holes is there was a, a drop of liquid in there. So I don't think the caterpillar goes in and I don't think it could go in. But unfortunately, I, my observations had to stop at this point because I needed to go home. And this one's on dogwood, the fruits of dogwood. And notice this white here. And this one here, all this white. So the contents of this have been eaten out by a holly blue larva. And there's this pad of white silk here, which has been spun from the outside. You won't see this in any textbooks. I, I just don't know what's going on. But you see the same when it comes to ivy buds. And, you know, I often, almost always when I find holly blue larvae feeding on these buds, some of them have been had a pad of silk sewn from the outside over them. So if you look inside, the, the, the middle's been eaten out. So I don't know what's going on. And you bring the caterpillar into captivity and the, the silk pads don't appear. So it may be that it's not the holly blue that's doing it. But if anyone wants to research that, they'd be very welcome because I can't puzzle it out. And uh, now we're going on to the grayling. The grayling is a bit of a moorland butterfly, really. And uh, the grayling is in the family Nymphalidae. And it's the subfamily, the browns are in the subfamily, the satyrinae of the, of the um, nymphalidae. And the whole of the nymphalidae are characterised by walking on four feet. So it's, these are the four-footed butterflies. Um, my mother was a biology teacher. And when I was a small boy, she used to tell me that uh, insects had six legs and butterflies were insects. And of course, I would walk around the garden and I thought, blimey, these have got four legs. But in fact, the, the other pair on the first thoracic segment are, are really reduced and they're not functional for walking at all. They're rather vestigial. And the, the uh, small heath, another common butterfly, heathland, moorland species that you can see again on its four legs. Now I'm just going to quickly whiz through a few um, more butterflies of the more wider countryside now. Uh, because I just wanted to mention briefly the big butterfly count, which is run by Butterfly Conservation every year. And this year it runs from the 17th of July to the 9th of August. And you can find out all about it by going to the Butterfly Conservation website or Googling big butterfly count, and there'll be a lot more publicity near the time. But essentially it's a citizen science thing. You just choose your patch of land, which could be on Dartmoor, it could be your garden, probably 
most commonly people choose their gardens and you just wander around for 15 minutes recording the butterfly species you see and writing down the maximum number of each species that you see at any one time. So this is the speckled wood, the meadow brown, pair of mating meadow browns, the hedge brown or gatekeeper, the female with the big orange patch here, and the male with a bit of darker brown in the middle of the orange patch, the peacock, red admiral, small tortoiseshell, comma, and here's a comma from the underside, you can, showing you why it's called the comma, and uh, this sort of um, jagged shape edge to the leaf, which makes it look very much like a dead leaf in actual fact. And again, you can see it's walking on four feet. But you have to be a bit careful to make sure you do get the identification right. And there aren't too many difficulties. Probably the white butterflies offer as much difficulty as anything. Um, this is a large white. I'm afraid I haven't got a picture of the top side. But the thing is about the large white is it's, it's bigger than the others. And also the black at the tip of the top side of the wing comes further down this edge. OK, and this is the small white. So this is a second brood small white with a uh, blackish tip here and one black spot here. The first brood doesn't have that black spot. And the female has much more black spotting, you know, extra extra black spots on the on the wing. And if you look on the underside, it's got this yellowish white plain colour. But you need to distinguish it from the green veined white. So this is the male green veined white first generation, uh, whereas the um, second generation would have would have a black spot like the male small white did. And with experience, you can see there's a bit of shading on the veins here. Um, but really, you need to see the underside, which shows here why it's called the green veined white. And this is the female green veined white with all this extra black spotting. So just another plug for the big butterfly count. Do get involved. It's a good citizen science project and the, the results are announced later on um, when, when it's all been analysed. So thank you for listening. And that's uh, that's the end of the presentation. So I just uh, wanted to say thank you for that talk. Really fascinating talk, uh, incredible photos and a real insight into the, the dedication and hard work of all the, the field craft that you've got there. Um, you know, to be able to spot all those little eggs and, uh, uh, and just all those holes, all you know, the, the, the sap leaking out of things, it's incredible, really. Um, I particularly liked the idea that uh, that we've got volunteers out on the moor uh, who are mimicking grazing animals and they're being replaced by technology. The robo flail. I hope the robo flail isn't here to stay. I hope there's still a place for volunteers and for grazers as well out on the moor. Uh, so uh, let's hope that uh, can continue. Um, and I liked I liked your uh, secret plug as well for. Uh, Butterfly conservation in the middle there, uh, having the, the reserve that you could uh, get to uh, only if you become a member of Butterfly Conservation. So I do urge everyone to uh, uh, to become a member of Butterfly Conservation, uh, not just to see the reserve, but uh, to support uh, their causes. So I'm just looking to see if there are any questions uh, coming through. Um, let's see what I can see on the, the list here. Uh, I think just I think just people have been very much enjoying uh, seeing what's been going or listening to what you've been ta talking about, Barry. Uh, got some nice thank yous coming in. Uh, Matt Parkins was fascinated by the detail of White Admiral, and I think that yeah, I was particularly taken by that. Um, I, was, I wanted to know and ask sort of on behalf of all of us, perhaps, uh, if it's if it's overwintering in that little tiny uh, shady. Uh, case, how, do, how does it survive all those frosts uh, through the winter? Well, it just does. I mean, it's... Uh... <laughs>
Uh, I mean, it, you know, it, it's um, it's evolved to to exist in in, in this climate, and uh, you know, the, I, I guess the um, you know, it's it's not it's not made of water. It's made of you know that the liquids in it will be will have salts in them, won't they? So the the free the freezing point will be less than naught. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean it's extraordinary, really. But um, you know, these insects do have to survive these temperatures. Yeah, I think so. And I think we we it's easy, isn't it, for us to anthropomorphise and so think, well, how could we survive there? So. So yeah, you've got to think the physiology of the creature is different. Um, yeah, and some I just wondered. I thought I'd heard someone say once that they sort of that their blood is has got like a bit of antifreeze in it or equivalent, and that's probably what you're saying, really, in the more uh, technical way. They're probably just, we're trying to put me off by or you know deal with the fact I'm a lay person and just go, yeah, it's kind of antifreeze, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so that's that's great and. Uh, yeah, I didn't realise that butterflies only had four legs either, or, or some butterflies only had four legs. Uh, so that's uh, that's going in my uh, little memory bank when I go and uh, speak to children out and about as well. Uh, so that's great. Well, the purest, um, the purest, of course, would say they've got six legs, but it's just that the first two legs are so small you don't see them and they don't use them for walking. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and with the caterpillars as well, they... Obviously, they've got six real legs because they're an insect as well, but they've, they've got pro legs and things as well. Yes. So, yeah. so they, we often imagine, don't we, that they've got lots and lots of legs. So, uh, uh, yeah, do, I mean, is there sort of like an average number of these extra legs that sort of the butterflies have? Uh, yes, the yes, have? there is. Um, I mean, they, they've got pro legs on the third, fourth, fifth and sixth seg abdominal segments. And, of course, a, another pair on the on the final segment but um uh, but they're um but, but they're known as the anal claspers but they are they are pro legs really they're on the yeah yes um oh and david cochran is just asking and i think this is about the white admirals is there any evidence that the latrines are eaten a second time no in fact the i mean the latrines often blow away you know if you have a sort of um you know a, a, a bit of a gale in in august when they're around i mean you you can often not find the latrines um it, it's it's a very odd business they seem to go to a lot of trouble over it but yes. um <laughs> yeah it just seemed bizarre does it because 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 i just thought sort of caterpillars just just uh let those let those pellets just drop the fresh drop wherever they were really well but yes, but th there is a bit more to it than that, because some species actually have combs which flick the frass pellets away. And um, so I think the frass pellets on a leaf could attract predators. Um, yeah. And certainly the, you know, the white butterflies, particularly the sort of the orange tip, manages to to flick the frass pellets away. And the, the large, the skipper butterflies do as well. The large skipper's got a particularly intricate... Um, anal comb it's called which you can't see unless you lift up the anal flap and it just sort of flicks flicks the pellets so yeah and in the moth some of the moths do it as well yeah Excellent. I, well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you could answer a serious point and not be childish and smirk when you're starting to talk about <laughs> anal combs and claspers and things <laughs> uh, it's obviously just the child in me that finds that funny <laughs> <laughs> um we've got a couple more serious questions uh rather than my uh, babbling here. Uh, we've got roughly how much vegetation does each caterpillar eat? So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I suppose, sort of, that's in, you know, is it just eating one leaf or two leaves or half a dozen leaves or? Well, are we talking about caterpillars in general or the white admiral now? Well, I think it's probably come from the from that in-depth look at the white admiral. Okay. But I, well, maybe if we stick with that. Well, I think all I can tell you really is up until the diapause, which is the most interesting stage. And it may be that one, if it's if it's on a sizable leaf, one leaf will be enough. And of course, it's not eating all that leaf because a lot of it, it's dropping it down to, to form the latrine. But if it's on a smaller leaf and finishes that leaf, it'll go off and start tackling another leaf. But it leaves a silk trail and then it always goes back to the original 
um, uh, central midrib on which to rest. But of course, you know, then in the spring, it's going to need to eat a good few leaves. I can't tell you how many, but it, it, <laughs> it will eat several leaves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems it seems highly uh, dangerous or make itself very vulnerable to go back to that central spine all the time, doesn't it? To, you know, it's sort of rather than keep hiding in different places or under the leaf or something, to actually rest in full sight. And it's not particularly camouflaged on that on that vein uh, it's quite incredible really yeah 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 um i've got um so so okay so i think we've answered that a little bit um helen wants to know uh what's the advantage in having four legs instead of six is there an advantage to that well you're stretching my knowledge here but i think <laughs> i think that um some of the taste organs on butterflies are on their legs and it may be that those vestigial legs or they're vestigial and they're not being used for locomotion are used for for taste but um you know there's um all sorts of animals in evolutionary time you know a structure becomes degenerate that um just stays there as a bit of a vestige really our appendix is is one example, and uh, you know our and we don't have a tail. The apes don't have a tail. It's um, it, but we have a little vestige, the coccyx, you know. So yes, yes, and who knows what our hands are going to look like in years to come? We may just have a thumb, might we? So we can, <laughs> or just those fingers. Um, uh, we've also got here uh, a question uh, which I think is quite interesting because we were talking about ash trees on Tuesday when we had our lichen talk. Uh, so uh, Andy wants to know uh, whether there are any caterpillars particularly dependent on ash trees, and if so, you know, is that going to be a concern? Well, yes, there are. There's a, you know, a number of, um, there's no butterfly caterpillars dependent on ash, but there are certainly plenty of moths. Uh, probably relatively few that only use ash, but others that where ash is one of their major food plants. In fact, I was helping a PhD student only a couple of weeks ago who's um, looking into uh, a particular moth called the ash bud moth, Praise fraxinella, and its effect on, um, you know, how, how it's going to be affected by the ash dieback in various woods. Uh, and in fact, you know, it's it had a close relationship with ash trees in so much. I mean, the ash trees didn't get anything out of it other than it would, the caterpillars would eat out the central bud of the ash tree, which caused then more branching. And so this moth effectively was affecting the the, the eventual shape of an ash tree. Yes. So it's, uh, it's um, yeah, and there's, you know, the centipod sallow is another moth that comes to mind where the eggs are laid on the buds of ash and the caterpillars actually hatch in December and burrow into the ash buds and, and then feed on the ash leaves um, in the spring. So, yeah, well, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But um, then there, it's going to be a bit of a problem for the ash feeding species, that's for sure. I think so. It's going to be echoes of, of when we lost all the elms, isn't it? I think Is it, is it the white hair streak? That, that is the white hair streak, yeah, that's absolutely right. But... That particularly on witch elm, but the white letter hair streak is very difficult butterfly to find. I mean, it's it's not common, but it's pretty widespread. And I didn't. Um, I mean, that's on Dartmoor in the East Dartmoor National Nature Reserve, for example, and it's down the road here, me, about a mile away from where I live. But it's it's fiendishly difficult to find. Yes. But they but they managed to cope with, um, you know, with it with the with, when the big ash trees went. They managed to cope. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll find a way. And, and it's, elm trees. Yeah. It's good to it's good for us to be thinking about sort of what we do about our landscape, which is going to have a big change over these next few years, isn't it? Um, and we do see a lot of a lot of uh, doom and gloom coming out of sort of all these organisations telling us sort of like the state of our wildlife, and and it does feel like it's real call to action for all of us to do to do more so things like the butterfly count is, is fantastic because it will engage more people get new, more people out and about and uh, better observation skills and, and better records and, and get us thinking about what we can do for wildlife and it's great these projects that have been going on on Dartmoor with the volunteers and, and all the work with the three 
but all the more butterflies uh, project as well that's been going over the last few years so uh, so yes so that's fantastic so um, thank you for that Barry I'm just this month we're thinking wildlife so really encourage you all to get out and about explore Dartmoor's woodlands uh, its moorlands and its wild places and look for butterflies and moths and all things wild and wonderful uh, so thank you Barry uh, great to have you with us thank you to everybody out there um, uh, if there's no more questions then I'm going to sort of retire if you do have any more questions then you can always email us at education at dartmoor.gov.uk uh, in the meantime have a great week uh, enjoy the weather, whatever you get up to, and we'll see you very soon. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye now.